want to, but obviously <clears throat> I like to see people's faces. So feel a little pressure from me to, to put, turn your cameras on. So thank you. All right, next slide. So tonight we have a couple things that we've thrown out to the agenda. Chance. Um, oops, hold on. Not really? Dan, I'm going to go ahead and mute you for a second. Um, so a couple things on the agenda tonight that um, we've thrown on here that I thought you guys would enjoy and would be helpful for some of our conversations. Um, we have asked us uh, Kim Sikowski, uh, one of our Eagle project managers, uh, senior project manager to come on and talk to us um, and just and and kind of walk through the process of what it's taken to try to get some uh, access to for one of the precautionary sampling events that we're doing around the Lansing Capital Airport. So Kim's going to talk to us today and you guys will have a chance to ask her questions. And then we're also going to have a special presentation by uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Kristen and Ashley are going to talk about the uh, program that's in development from DHHS about drinking water and health, which I thought was very timely. And um, I asked them to come and and talk through some of their ideas with this group as well. Um, and we'll have plenty of time to get into the subcommittee updates. I know Ken's going to present um, those subcommittee uh, the recommendation that we've been working on for the last couple months. And then we'll go through agency updates, community feedback, and and figure out what we want to do next. So, any questions before I get started? All right, excellent. Uh, we should go to the next slide then. Oh, uh, basic basic ground rules. Um, remember, we're always we are a sounding board for process improvement. This isn't about anybody. This is always about process improvement. We're providing solutions. Um, we're working on statewide concerns for PFAS issues. And, you know, we really seek, we hope that everybody seeks to be open and understand each other on a variety of perspectives because we're all coming from different parts of the state. And I think it's really important to be able to have that, um, you know, respectful conversations so that we can make progress and, you um, and and start those conversations. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, Kim is a, a project manager and now is going to be actually transitioning into the uh, position as a brownfield coordinator for remediation redevelopment division. Kim and I have worked together for many many years, and she is excellent at her job. So, Kim. Uh, I'm not seeing your face, yeah, but I'm if you sure. want to take well, it I away. Realized, I realized when I got on here that I'm wearing the same outfit as what's in my picture, so it's a little weird. Didn't realize I wore this outfit so often, but um, anyway, <laughs> yeah. So as Abby said, um, she asked me to just kind of give an overview of um. The challenges we've had obtaining access to do residential sampling out at um, the Lansing City Airport. It was something that we we're doing proactively. So at this time we had, well, we still have no information whether or not um, there's any PFAS impacts there, but um, we wanted to go ahead and start the sampling process just to, um, you know, see if there's any issues. Yep, thanks Kelly. Um, so generally how Eagle seeks um, access to private property is through writing. So we like to get at least one signed access form um, acknowledging that we've been there. And we usually do this um, either via mail and it will come with a cover letter or in person. And when we send the cover letter, it's just a quick um, two pager. Basically what it's saying is um, the intro paragraph will just kind of go over why we're requesting the access. We emphasize that the work we're doing is free and that we'll try to leave as little impact as possible on their property. Um, we ask for the access signed and um, we assure them that they'd get a copy of the results. And most importantly, on that last page of the cover letter, we give contacts so that if there's any questions that need to be answered in the future, they have um, something in writing, they know how to, uh, um, get in touch with them via email 
or phone or address. So um, when we get this, um, the second page of the access um, letter is, or excuse me, the um, main form just basically has their signature down at the bottom. And the top part of the form is just general about you know, location and how to contact the homeowner themselves or the property owner so that um, we can have open communication with them. Um, next page or next slide. And like um, Abby said, this is more or less a case study on what happened at the Capital Area Regional Airport. Next slide. So for those of you who are not familiar, um, the Lansing Regional Airport is located on the north side of Lansing in um, a fairly densely populated area. It's right at the um, intersection of three counties, Ingham, Eaton, and Clinton County, and it um, reaches over several different units of government, including DeWitt, DeWitt Township, Watertown Township, Lansing, and Delta Township. Next slide. And um, prior to this request to do the residential sampling out at the airport, I had no idea how many residential wells were in the area. So this is a map of what came up from Well Logic when I put in the area. Um, what you're seeing is um, all the dots are wells. Um, and we are most concerned about this area over to the far right. Um, that whole neighborhood is on private wells. But what we did was um, we narrowed down our sampling points um, to 47, and I'll get to that as we go along. But what you'll see is um, our areas were chosen based on groundwater flow, which is generally to the south and southeast. And we got that information from um, baseline environmental assessments that were done on the property. Um, if it was located near one of the county drains that cut across the property, or if it was down gradient of an airplane crash that occurred on the property. And th that's how we chose our locations. Next slide. So starting back on April 7th is when um, I was tasked with um, doing the residential sampling out at the airport. So again, I looked at Well Logic just to identify um, wells that were in the area and I compiled a list of um, wells that could potentially be impacted if there were um, PFAS associated with the airport. And I compiled that list and sent it to um, our counterparts at DHHS on April 7th. Um, over the next week, DHHS reviewed that list and added some additional wells and returned it to me. And we had a discussion um, to make sure that we felt it was complete before sharing with the local um, health departments. Upon sharing that with them, we narrowed down that 47 letter or 47 properties um, would be selected for sampling as part of this initial effort to determine if there were impacts around the airport. Next slide. Um, I guess I should have highlighted on April 15th is when the letters went out. So over the next two weeks, Eagle received five signed access report access uh, agreements back. And when I say we received them, they didn't actually um, come in the mail. We received um, pictures of the signed access via text. And again, we sent out 47 and five came back and there were a couple wrong. Well, in undeliverable letters, um, one of the homes had been destroyed and, you know, there were some a couple issues with mail, but overall, most of them made it and we only received response from five. So Eagle was concerned about the low response. So we had another meeting with DHHS and um, we felt that perhaps having um, the local health department try to reach out to homeowners that they may be familiar with to try to get access from some additional residents might be um, more useful than having Eagle contact them just because of um, you know, being one layer of government closer to the community, we thought that might be more useful. Um, they did that and we received one additional access agreement from that effort. Then again, we were a little concerned about a lack of response. So we had um, an additional effort where we looked at some law enforcement databases to try to get better contact information for some of the homeowners. 
Um, and we shared that with DHHS and local health. And again, they reached out um, trying to contact them and did not get any additional response. Next slide. Um, so on May 13th, we decided to do an effort of um, going door to door. So I went out to all the wells that we established as being shallow wells, and those were uh, wells that were sh um, shallower than 50 feet in depth. So I went door to door and I was able to get two additional signed access agreements, and then I left door hangers or access agreements with other people that were at home. Um, no additional responses were received from that. So then the next day, DHHS went out to other priority homes um, in the area, and they were able to get three additional signed access agreements. And again, they left door hangers and ac blank access agreements with people, but we did not get any additional um, signed access forms back from this. So that got us to um, 11 access agreements, and we felt that it was worth having um, our contractor go out and conduct sampling. So sampling was scheduled that day to be conducted on April 20, or excuse me, on May 27th. Um, AECOM was able to secure 10 um, ground or 10 residential well samples. The 11th home denied access to them when they got there. So that's why we only got 10 instead of 11 samples. Um, next slide. So in summary, um, the process began on April 7th. We targeted 47 homes and we were able to only get 11 access agreements from the 47 homes. We tried this during um, via mail, via phone call and in person um, attempts. And again, only 11 were secured. And from that, we were only able to sample 10 homes. So what we learned from this exercise is um, it's not always easy. Like we thought it would be because we had so many homes that were in the area, we thought it'd be fairly easy to get access to um, to do this investigation. And we found that it was just not, people were not interested in um, hearing from the government. Um, there are some hard feelings from um, the runway expansion that occurred couple years ago um, at the airport and how property was annexed. And I, I mean, I guess I just don't have a good reason, but we were just totally um, unable to secure more than the 10 access agreements. So what we learned was it's just not um, as straightforward as what we think it's going to be. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. That's a great presentation. Um, oops, there we go. Uh, so I think that really brings up, I think part of the reason that I wanted Kim to help uh, present today was just to give you an idea of some of the challenges of uh, Eagle and DHHS for, for getting out and trying to get a hold of residents um, because it is challenging every, every um, it almost seems like every generation responds in a different way. So if you're a young person, you want to get a text or you want to get something on Facebook. If you're an older generation, maybe you want to get it by phone or by email or by, you know, uh, snail mail. I think there's a, a variety of information and potential reasons for this, but it does present some real challenges. So opening this up for discussion and I see AJ's got his hand up. Go ahead, AJ. Yeah, it sounds like you were engaged. It sounds like you were engaged in a frustrating process. Um, it might be helpful to actually ask why someone is not willing to sign it, just to you know, help encourage responses later, or however you want to couch it. You know, you still might not, but um, that's a frustratingly low uh, number considering, you know, two door-to-door -door, uh, efforts out to try and get this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is, it is. So, I mean, I think that's where we got to start thinking outside the box of of our traditional responses, our traditional ways of getting 
access obviously aren't yielding a lot of good fruit. So, um, Charlie, I see your hands up. Yeah, thanks, Abby. Can you hear me? Sure. Um, I, I, I want to thank, uh, I express my thanks and gratitude for the presentation. Um, it's of interest to me, given that the um, <clears throat> East Bay Township matter in Traverse City is proximal to the Cherry Capital Airport. And I would suggest that um, many, certainly not all of these airport locations, are um, certainly uh, becoming increasingly known to their neighbors for, you know, the noise impacts, uh, which are often unregulated, the PFAS impacts, which we all know about, um, uh, lead emissions from piston engine aircraft, um, which can be severe in places that have large amounts of piston engine aircraft activity. And so the nature of the of those kind of sites, those kind of airport sites, and uh, as, as illustrated by this example and by the Cherry Capital uh, Airport example, you know, suggests that Eagle is, is going to need to have, um, you know, uh, uh, a good strategy for engaging the neighbors because uh, the neighbors in, in many of these locations, uh, you know, rightfully uh, don't have a lot of confidence in, uh, in state and local and federal government due to the large uh, amount of environmental impact that these uh, facilities impose on their neighbors. Thank you. All right, thanks, Charlie. Um, I see Brad has got his hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, I was just taking a quick look at the, uh, at the at the letter that was sent, and 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 really the only information that it talks about as far as PFAS is you know, what what PFAS is. <clears throat> I'm assuming that when you met with people, you explained the the. I don't say urgency, and you don't want to you don't want to get people um, excited or upset about something that may or may not be an issue in their well. But it seems like if you're trying to get some response, <clears throat> shouldn't there be more um, kind of like uh, just some kind of explanation as far as why you think it it's important, given what was just discussed about airports being a, uh, often being a source, and um, um, you know they may want to find out just to be safe. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the, that's a probably a pretty good suggestion, Brad, because I think a lot of our um, standard access letters were written for some of our um, historic site investigations where we're, we're working at the property adjacent to a big facility where they already know about the contamination, they already know about some of those issues. So in some of these cases, these people don't even know who Eagle is, let alone know what PFAS is. So... Yeah, I think that's probably one of our um, things we we're going to have to work on is probably looking at those letters and seeing if we can make them a little bit more generic so that they are not generic, but more plain language, um, as Sue Menente says, so that we can actually get the point across. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Just just because you've got such a low response rate uh, to the initial letter that, that would suggest that that people didn't see the importance of the letter in the first place. Just because they were going to get free sampling, it didn't necessarily mean, <clears throat> wow, you know, big deal. You know, we get offered free things all the time, and and uh, so we we tend to be suspicious of that. What's the catch type of thing, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, good input. Thank you. Thank you. I see Bob's hands up. Bob? Evening, Abby. How are you? Great. How are you doing, Bob? Good. Thank you. Um, just consistent with the rest of your agenda tonight, um, I'd like to basically tell you where I'm at in Brighton Township. Um, we have people who come around our streets and um, look, they're assessors, and they're coming around asking for permission to look at our homes and, uh, and raise our taxes. So people are generally a little suspicious. Um, on the other hand, the rest of your... Um, uh, agenda tonight talks about testing well water. Um, I'd suggest it might be a really good idea to consider a general well water, voluntary well water testing program uh, across various townships or even across the state that um, you know, was a little higher volume 
that tests all the million wells that you have and that actually tells the state and the community um, where there are problems. Um, it's something that's with a million wells serving millions of people, um, certainly very important to the, to the state. And um, with all the influence you guys have up there in Lansing, maybe you can get something like that done rather than try to act like the local um, uh, assessor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would love to be able to do that, Bob. That would be fantastic. A um, little out of my budget right now, but that's my big that's my big goal is to try to get some sort of a fund for doing residential testing. So I agree. Thanks for that. Ken, your hand is up. Yeah, one of the things we heard loud and clear in the subcommittee, which we're going to be reporting on shortly, was uh, contacts with local units of government where feasible and have them partner. I don't know that I heard that in that discussion. That's a good point. Kim, can you talk to that? How much did you have uh, contacts with um, local health, local uh, townships, any of the cities, that kind of stuff? Sure. Um, so initially, before we began all this, we had one big meeting that um, we invited local officials and the local health to just to give them a heads up that, hey, here's what we're thinking. We're trying to be proactive. We don't actually have data yet, but we want to do this sampling effort. So all the townships, the city and the local health were invited to that meeting and they did participate. Um, after that initial meeting, all of our contact with the local health department was um, done through DHHS. And we had, you know, numerous emails that went back and forth and we were um, keeping everybody in contact. But, um, you know, when it actually came to moving that out to the community, um, for whatever reason, the community just wasn't um, open, you know, to having discussions. Did, um, I guess the question is, so Kim, did we, we probably didn't ask specifically for the townships or cities to specifically um, make a request on our behalf, though, did we? No, we did not. Okay. And that, that might just be a different angle. We just would have to be careful with that. Ken, did that answer your question, though? Yeah, that was. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. All right, I see um, Bob Pataki, is your hand back up or still up? No, it's not up. Okay, we'll we'll get it down then. Um, I see Mary Blanchard, your hand is up. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on Holly Townships um, and Village regarding our recent testing and I personally contacted uh, both the staff at the village and the township and the full board, and neither of them made an effort to contact the homeowners around our dump. Um, it was actually Stacy Taylor and I who actually went um, door to door and informed uh, most of the people. So um, the village is the responsible party identified by Eagle, so you can understand their reluctance to get involved. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Lynn, your hand up. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, we sure can. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to go back to what Bob just said uh, about <laughs> testing you know, uh, a million of these wells. And I understand, of course, that you don't have the budget. But how can we get that budget? What What do you suggest or what do others suggest? To me, that is going to be ultimately something that's going to give us the most information. And if it can be coordinated in a large way, I think it would be very helpful. It, it is easy to stop at that budget point. Mm -hmm. But how can we engage the governor? How can we engage our legislators to say, we need this money. There's constituents in your, you know, in the areas that you represent that we're concerned about. And 
it is a very uneven process going to cities and townships. Yeah. Um, most cities and townships are not going to be thrilled at this opportunity to field all these questions and on and on. But if it's a large program and you can get a lot of in information quickly, what? how much money is that? And why not find a way to at least get that message to a way it could be funded? That's my question. That's my thought. I think it's a great question. And Lynn, let's come back to it at the end of the meeting, because I think okay. um, that is worth some additional roundtable talk or um, different ways that we can do some advocacy for that question. So, OK, that's fine. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm seeing a couple hands up and I'm not sure if these are hands that are stretching or hands that still have uh, questions. So I'm. Um, thinking we'll probably go on to our next presentation because at this point um, I want to make, be respectful of time and Kristen Ward and Ashley Mark are here from Department of Health and Human Services uh, both working on uh, what I thought was a very impressive campaign for drinking water and health promotion which I think really ties in perfectly with what we've been talking about as far as being, um, you know, clean, basically clean water advocates, being advocates for getting uh, our our private well owner uh, tested across the state. So, um, Kristen, Ashley, you guys uh, ready to go? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Sounds awesome. great. Sounds great. Awesome. Um, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for having us here tonight. Um, my name is Kristen Ward and I'm a health educator and a program manager for our drinking water and health promotion program uh, within the Division of Environmental Health. And my colleague Ashley is also here with me tonight. Um, so Ashley, if you want to introduce yourself. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I am the drinking water unit technician and I've been working closely with Kristen and many others um, on outreach, education and research for the program. Thanks, Ashley. Um, so tonight we're going to provide uh, an overview of our program. So we're going to highlight some of the programs, our program need and purpose, and then we're going to highlight some of the activities that we have in place um, and ones that we're currently working on and then some that are planned for the future. Next slide. Um, so first I want to describe a little bit about the Division of Environmental Health. So we serve to promote and protect the health of people of Michigan, and we do this by using the best available methods um, to educate residents about potential hazards and actions that they can take to reduce those potential health risks. Um, and so by applying these best available science, our vision and hope is that we can end or prevent um, the injury from environmental, uh, chemical, and physical hazards and to promote equity for all Michiganders. And so our divisions developed what we like to call our three eyes that really highlight how we operate. So we have identify, investigate and intervene. So by using these three eyes, we can really um, identify an exposure and then we can investigate those related health effects to those exposures. And then we intervene with public health actions. So as we all know, drinking water has become a really big focus in our state over the past few years. And we find new areas of concerns or gaps in resources and education that are being identified. And this is where our division can come in and help bring awareness and education where, is there the, where there's that potential health risk. <clears throat> um, this has really forced us to really identify diverse and tailored approaches to spreading that awareness and education. Um, education to help all Michiganders inclusively. Um, so this. The, to help address some of these concerns in our state, the uh, My Drinking Water and Health Promotion Program, we was developed with the purpose of increasing Michiganders' knowledge and awareness on how drinking water may impact health. So we really hope by implementing this program, we're going to encourage residents to take actions to re, uh, to reduce and prevent those exposures. <clears throat> So 
So this program is aimed at primarily the individual level. So we really are encouraging residents to be aware and understand water quality so they can make informed decisions about their health. So as you can see here on our slide, this is our purpose statement, and it's really to empower Michiganders to make informed decisions and to take action to protect their health from drinking water contamination through equitable promotion, education, and engagement. Next slide. Um, so on this slide here, uh, we're gonna kind of highlight um, our needs assessment. So really to help guide the development and implementation of our program, um, we decided to do a needs assessment. And this will really ensure that the campaign um, is communicating information that Michiganders want and need to know as well as being able to reach them effectively. So this needs assessment is going to include a literature review, a collaboration analysis, key informant interviews, a survey and focus groups. So looking at our literature review, this is something we've already conducted and this has really helped guide and support the purpose of our, um, our approaches. And so our liter literature review really defined our problem statement and helped us identify some of those gaps and barriers that are already in place. Um, and it also helped us to understand what's already been tried and what worked well and where we may need some improvements. Then we have our collaboration analysis. So we have a community engagement team that's um, done a lot of research and pulled together a comprehensive list of potential groups and organizations like MPART um, that have a direct interest in drinking water and those that have those strong relationships within the communities that could really help us elevate um, this program. So we've shared this, um, what we're calling our collaborators worksheet with the Clean Water Advocate Ambassadors. So we can gather some of their suggestions and feedback um, on that list that we have developed. Then we have our key informant interviews, which we're currently working on right now. Um, and we're gonna use that information to just gather insight from individuals that work on the topic of drinking water and or directly with our anticipated audiences for our program. Um, so this is really going to help shape our survey and inform our, camp, our, our program's goals, objectives, and strategies. And then we also have what we're calling our exploratory survey that we're working on. Um, and so this is a survey where we're going to use to gather Michigan-specific data. And it's really focused on residents' attitudes, their knowledge, uh, perceived risks, and behaviors as it relates to drinking water. Um, we anticipate the survey is going to help us identify our target populations. Um, for our messaging and our programming. So this will assist with the program to ensure that all of our goals and objectives and things like that will really meet the needs of Michiganders. And then the last part of our needs assessment is focus groups. And by holding focus groups, this will really allow us the opportunity to get feedback directly from um, residents themselves. Um, so this is gonna, we're gonna be sharing some of our products and messaging we have. It'll hopefully identify some gaps um, and just really, we just want to hear from them so we can make sure we're we're developing messaging that's going to encourage more residents to be proactive with their drinking water. Next slide. Uh, so based on our literature review and our experiences, um, these are the three goals that we've identified for our program. Um, again, once we complete our needs assessment, these goals um, may change based on what we learn from residents with the different ways that we're collecting this um, baseline data. So as you can see on the screen, our goal one is really to inform and educate Michigan residents on their drinking water supply type and encourage them to adopt best drinking water practices. Goal two is to educate private well owners about the importance of well maintenance and encourage actions to reduce drinking water contamination and potential health risks. And then our goal three is to promote and offer equitable educational opportunities on ways public water supply residents can learn about their drinking water quality to make informed decisions about their health. Um, so once we complete our needs assessment and we make any of our modifications that we need to, uh, to our program goals, the program will be able to solidify and develop our messaging based on our audience needs. Um, we have, you know, draft versions of this kind of information, but ultimately we need to make sure that it's going to actually resonate with our residents. And so with the understanding of how to reach our audience and what types of messaging e each audience needs. Um, so we can then begin developing what we hope to be is a mass media campaign that we're estimating to be launched in 2022 or 2023. Um, and it's going to be based on what we collect from that needs assessment so we can better reach those audiences. So 
from this information, we're hoping that we can learn that maybe well owners on the west side of the state um, are better reached through YouTube ads versus the east side of the state who may be better reached versus with billboards. Um, so this is really going to help us know where to allocate our resources towards these different outlets um, to really help get our messaging across. Um, and also that type of messaging. So maybe again, the west side of the state as an example, maybe they know a lot about testing. So we might not need to push that messaging as much in that area, um, but maybe they also need more messaging around well maintenance. And so this data that we're collecting is really gonna help make sure that we're using our resources efficiently. Um, so now Ashley and I are going to highlight some of the activities for our goal one and goal two that we've developed. Um, and so starting with goal one, again, this one focuses on drinking water supply type and uh, drinking water practices. So as we all know, water is um, a great resource. It's an essential thing for all living things, but it's really also essential that we're aware of our own drinking water quality. Um, and in order to know that, you first need to know where drinking water comes from. Uh, so through our experience and what we've learned from communities, there's some individuals that don't know where their water comes from. Um, and it's also really important to know this because each water supply type is regulated a little bit differently. So that means some may be regularly tested and treated by a water supplier, while others, the responsibility of those activities fall on the homeowner like a private well owner. Um, so this is a gap that we felt that we needed to address. So we're working on some messaging and products around this topic. And this is just the illustration on the screen is just one of the products that we're, we've been working on um, and that we'll be testing um, in our focus groups. So and another um, important piece of goal one is promoting behaviors and actions that everyone can do to protect their drinking water and health. So based on a thorough literature review as a team, we came up with the top five best practices or 5X um, for drinking water. And this list is really still evolving as we learn more about Michiganders. Um, so we're preparing to use the um, exploratory survey to better understand what Michiganders already do and don't do, what they know and their attitudes around certain behaviors. And based on the exploratory survey, as well as what we learn in focus groups, um, that will help us determine how we choose to prioritize education around the different behaviors and decide if we need to revise the list of actions to better fit the needs of Michigan residents. So as of right now, the five acts we plan to educate about include um, first flushing your pipes. So when water sits still in your pipes, contaminants from the pipes can be released into that standing water. And flushing or running your water um, is one way to remove certain contaminants before drinking the water. The second is aerator cleaning. Um, the aerator is the little screen at the end of your faucet. And one of its purposes is to filter out particles. So cleaning can help to maintain that ability to remove contaminants and can also prevent um, build up in the aerator from causing additional contamination. The third act is checking your home plumbing. So this includes checking for signs of corrosion or damage and also just knowing what types of pipes you have in your home um, and understanding how the type of pipe can potentially impact your water quality. Um, fourth is testing your water and filtering if needed. This is especially important for well owners. Um, and testing is really the only way to know for sure what is in your water and the results can help you to decide if you require a filter. And the fifth act is stepping up for the environment. Um, this is also known as stewardship and it really involves doing things to help the environment and avoiding things that harm the environment and the water that becomes our drinking water. Next slide please. Um, so another activity that we've participated in is the Drinking Water Awareness Week, which was back in May. Um, so we collaborated with the Office of Clean Water Public Advocates, Eagle and MPART, on raising awareness on, and offering educational opportunities um, that are all focused around drinking water. So we helped to develop some of the new messaging and bring awareness around information that's already been available. Um, just to recap, what we did go over that week is that day one, we focused on how do you get your drinking water and where does it come from? 
Day two, we worked on a proclamation so that every May 4th, it's going to be Private Residential Awareness Day here in Michigan. So that's really exciting. Um, and then the work group wanted to really focus on two bigger topics um, going on in Michigan. So that was on day three, we focused on PFAS and drinking water. And then day four, we focused on lead and drinking water. And the last day really just wanted to highlight how we can all get involved by just sharing information, caring for our environment, or just organizing or participating in drinking water events in our communities. Um, so we're hoping that this is a collaboration that we'll, we'll be able to do every year moving forward. <clears throat> um, some additional things that we have in the works right now, we are developing specific web pages dedicated to drinking water and health and primarily focused around our three goals that we um, had talked about earlier. And so we really just want to make sure we're providing and making accessible the important information that we have identified from this program um, online and in one spot. So then that way we have one central location that we can send people to to learn a little bit more about the topics that we're talking about. Um, in addition to that, we're also going to be developing a newsletter for drinking water and health. Um, so this is just another opportunity for us to share important information and resources that are available. So as you can see here on the, so on the slides, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Um, we're thinking it's probably going to be monthly, but we haven't quite figured that all out just yet, but that's, that's in the works for us right now. Um, our team is also in the process of developing a drinking water and health promotion toolkit. So this document will be available on our website and it will include things like social media posts, um, fact sheets, images, videos, worksheets, and other tools that everyone can share to help promote the campaign. And the aim of it is really to just make it easy for people to share information about drinking water and health through whatever channels they want to. And there will also be an option within the toolkit to submit a request for additional materials, um, including printed materials from us if people want that. I muted myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> another project we'll begin planning this summer is the um, Youth Drinking Water Ambassador Project. So the hope is that we can reach school age children and empower them through education and opportunities for them to share what they learn about drinking water. So the plan right now is to launch this in phases and build upon each activity and it will likely be designed so um, if a child completes so many activities, they can earn points or rewards. So some of the activities we have in mind right now um, include reading. So we plan to provide a list of water related books to participants and also um, set up like opportunities to read to children, potentially in schools during reading month. Um, and then we can also provide the children with like promotional items during that visit. Um, second activity is encouraging kids to find an event in their community to get involved in. So maybe something like a river cleanup or a watershed council activity. And another one we're potentially looking at is a t testing program that can get kids involved in testing their homes drinking water. So we're still planning and we're still kind of designing activities, but the hope is to eventually open opportunities to a diverse group of children around the state. So that's kind of what we have planned for our goal one. And so now for goal two, which again focuses all on private res residential wells, um, we're building upon a program that's already been developed that we have um, through a CDC grant called My Well. So the main goal of My Well was to identify and address gaps in existing private well programs in Michigan. And one of the major programmatic gaps that we identified um, was that well owner education was um, with consistent messaging, the availability of those resources, and then actually reaching those, uh, those well owners. So with Michigan having over 1.2 million private residential wells, we felt that it was important for us to address some of those gaps. So um, one of the activities that we planned for MyWell was developing a website, which is now live. Um, so if you go to michigan.gov slash envirohealth and underneath our programs list, you can select care for MyWell. Um, so before we developed this website, we really needed to 
get a better understanding of what the needs were. So the program conducted a literature review. We discussed with programs across the state and we conducted a survey with local health departments um, to gather some of their feedback on what education um, they felt was needed based on their interactions with their community members. So from our findings, we kind of identified four main areas to focus on and that those are well maintenance, testing drinking water, uh, understanding a water test result, and then how to choose a water filter or home water treatment system if you need to. Um, so you can find information about all four of these uh, topics on our website. So feel free to go and take a look at that and share that widely. Um, but there's also other resources on there as well. Um, so our program also has a team of health educators who develop information informative um, materials that contain best practices that aim to protect well owners and their health. So this team's developed a series of materials that can help communicate some of these best practices that we can all be doing as a well owner. Um, so all the information we use and develop these materials come from extensive literature review and looking at the best practices and best available science from all sorts of organizations like the EPA, the CDC, ATSCR, and more. Um, and many of these products we've collaborated with Eagle on to make sure that we're sharing accurate information between the two part departments um, and that we're not contradicting ourselves either by saying it one way versus another and it might become confusing. So many of these products that you see on this um, slide here we've done in collaboration with Eagle. So that's been really exciting that we've had that partnership with them. Um, so again, here on this slide, you can see some of the products that we have available on our website. Um, so like we have a well maintenance fact sheet that really highlights well inspections, uh, routine water testing, um, knowing how to look for um, to pay attention to your well performance and then also about the water filter and water treatment. Um, we have another fact sheet that's dedicated to testing and the importance of it. So here's where we highlight why well owners should test, what to test for and when, and then we did describe um, uh, like descriptions of each of those contaminants. So DHHS provides recommendations in that fact sheet. Then we also have some um, contaminant specific fact sheets. So we have like coliform bacteria, nitrates and nitrite, copper, lead, and PFAS. We all we have that too. And then we also have some activity worksheets for kids because we know um, it's important messaging to get across to them early on because then they can also learn about it and bring that information home to their parents. So our first layer of messaging for well owners is really around raising awareness that as a well owner, you are responsible for your own well and for your drinking water. So since well owners do have this responsibility, it's important that they understand what they can do to protect their water and health. And that really is the focus of this layer of messaging. So we developed this mailer um, and it lays out four important actions that well owners can and should do as responsible well owners and also provides a link to our website to learn more about how to carry out these actions. Um, so the actions included on the mailer are maintaining your well, um, testing your water, understanding the drinking water test results, and also considering um, treatment or a filter if needed. So these will be delivered to Michigan residents who have um, newly repaired or modified wells as recorded in the Wellogic database. So that's estimated to be about 500 recipients per month. Um, so here we wanted to highlight a, an in initiative that we have um, under development right now. So our literature research has shown that community driven interventions when applied um, by influencing the influence of local and trusted professionals, it's proven to be very effective. So right now we're working to identify local and trusted professionals that can help us share this information um, with well owners. And we've identified that well drillers, home inspectors and realtors are a good place for us to start because they interact directly with the well owners. Um, and it's a really great way for us to make that connection directly with them. So once we make those connections with these groups, we're hoping that some of them are going to be willing to collaborate with us and share some of our, our well owner um, messaging and materials with um, their clientele.
So as part of a well owner's responsibility for their own well and for their water, they're also encouraged to keep their well properly maintained in order to avoid contamination of their water. So well assessed is another project for well owners that really is focused in on proper well maintenance. So it's a community engagement and education project and it will invite participants to complete a step-by-step -step well assessment through an online form. It will involve things like having them look for damage to their well, um, checking the surroundings for sources of contamination, and assessing the wellhead's condition overall. So the aim is to allow participants to learn a little bit more about what they should keep an eye out for regularly with regards to their well, it's not intended to replace um, a professional inspection. It's really for awareness and educational purposes. And as we receive the responses for this like survey form, um, we'll provide resources for addressing any serious issues that are identified. And then we'll also be able to follow up with participants to ensure that they have the resources to resolve that issue. And we'll be collaborating with the Clean Water Ambassadors on this project mainly to help get the word out about it um, and really do that like outreach piece. So as of right now, we are in the process of figuring out a pilot community for the project. Um, so that will hopefully be happening soon. Um, so another area that we feel is really important for private well owners to understand is what contaminants might be in the groundwater that you use for drinking. Um, so there's natural and human made contaminants that both can be found in groundwater and understanding these contaminants and where they can be in our environment can help protect our drinking water and our health. Um, so looking at our natural natural sources, the natural occurring contaminants that can be found in rocks, soil, um, it can also be found in lakes, river or groundwater. So in Michigan, natural occurring contaminants can vary depending on where you live. So some parts of the state are known to have higher levels of certain contaminants than other, um, like arsenic's one that we, you know, Eagle has maps on that on the higher areas in groundwater. Um, and then you get your human human made sources. And these are contaminations that don't happen or occur naturally in our environment and they're caused by human activity. So when chemicals are released in the environment, they can seep into the groundwater. Um, some common human made sources are like manufacturing facilities, agricultural runoff and improper waste disposal. Um, while these sources have the potential to contribute um, to contamination, there are precautions that can be and are often taken to prevent those contaminations from these sources. Um, so it's just really important to be aware of what might be around your home or in your community. So you can make a decision if you should be testing your drinking water for certain contaminants based on what you learn. Um, but we do want to, you know, highlight that just because you may live nearby one of these industries or something like that, um, that doesn't automatically mean that the groundwater is contaminated. It just means that there's a potential source of possible contamination just to be aware of, though. Um, and so it's just really important to be informed of that. Um, but as a state and as a community and as individuals, we can all do our part to really help protect our groundwater. Uh, so Michigan has programs and initiatives across the state like MPART and what your work group is working on that are working towards improving water quality around our great state. Um, and then as a community, we can all protect our environment and our drinking water sources, and we can do that through activities and programs that residents can get involved in. Um, so there's lots of opportunities within communities, so um, there's lots of resources out there already going on those types of topics. Um, and then as a private residential well owner, just having um, a well means you're responsible for your own water system, like Ashley had said earlier. And this includes protecting the groundwater used for drinking, um, along with taking care of your well system, making sure you're not um, over utilizing fertilizer or, or anything like that, keeping materials near your well head that shouldn't be there, um, testing your water, all those kinds of things can really make an impact. Um, on your water quality. So this campaign is really producing materials that can contribute to far reaching drinking water education and awareness around the state, but it really can benefit from the involvement of everyone. So even now, as this campaign is just starting and getting rolled out, 
um, there are many ways that you can start helping to share this info with your community. So here are some ways um, you can help promote and share our website. I posted the link in the chat. Um, you can also subscribe to our newsletter and stay up to date and let others know that they can also subscribe and that link is also in the chat. Um, you can share our social media posts. Um, they're posted the first Wednesday of the month on the MDHHS account on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. And you can share with Facebook groups or your like subdivision or neighborhood networks. Um, we also really encourage you to take our survey once we've shared it. That will be shared through social media and in the newsletter. Um, and if you want to participate in like future opportunities, you can provide your info on the survey to be invited to participate in focus groups, um, other surveys and phone interviews. And also you can let us know when there are events in your community that would be appropriate for our team to come in and share information at. Um, our contact info is on the first slide, so feel free to reach out to either of us. And also just spread the word about our campaign with your friends and family to get the word out. Um, I think that is all we have for tonight, but thanks for sharing your time with us. And I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, and a uh, great presentation. I think that's exactly the kinds of things we've been talking about for the last couple months. So. Hence why I was so excited to um, to hear about it through Kristen and Ashley. So thank you, ladies, for your time. It looks like we have a couple questions already. Um, Bob, I think your hand is up and you are top of my list. So what's your question or thank comment? You. Thank you, Abby. I really agree with you. This was a very important presentation. Um, Kristen and Ashley are going in exactly the right direction and they're taking us back where we need to be. Um, and I support what they're doing wholeheartedly. Um, two suggestions. One, um, you might want to call this really pure Michigan too. I mean, this is what it's all about and uh, um, cleaning up our water. And the second, um, um, I noticed that you've put a lot of burden on the well owner to have pure water. I'd like to make sure your copy and your um, message uh, informs the, the communities that uh, they have a right to expect that their that their government and their industry is taking care of their water and if they, they should unexpectedly follow our water that they have an absolute responsibility to both clean it and to tell us about it let us know that there is a problem don't hide it and uh, so it's a shared responsibility our water is supposed to be clean it came that way if it isn't now the people who screwed it up need to fix it Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bob. Uh, any uh, comments? I think that uh, Kristen and Ashley will probably take that back and see how they could incorporate some additional language. Yes. Thank you. Um, Brad, I think you're up next. All right, Brad, you got to unmute yourself, though. Sorry, I forgot that step. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, All right. I, good program, good presentation, good ideas. Um, my suggestion would be is that um, since mm, I'm guessing just about everybody that has a well also has an on-site waste, wastewater treatment system, their septic tank and tile field, uh, which is a um, less than ideal treatment system and with respect to being able to handle uh, various chemicals, household products, um, you know, we just have to be make people aware, I think, or, or encourage people to be aware that uh, when you rinse something, you push something down the drain and it goes into your septic tank and then discharges into your tile field. That's that's not being treated very effectively um, for many of the chemical, the industrial chemicals that are in household products. And so uh, um, most septic tank tile fields are within a few, you know, 50 feet or 100 feet of their dwells. So everybody can be doing their part by uh, trying to avoid contaminating their own and their neighbor's groundwater by uh, properly managing the materials that they're putting down their drain. Well said, Brad, well said. I agree. So, and I don't know, is there anything in the current uh, materials, Kristen or Ashley, regarding the septic field uh, potential question? Um, so we talk about 
very briefly in our well um, our well maintenance fact sheet, but it is something that our group has been talking about incorporating um, a little bit more on that topic. So it's good to hear that you know this is something an area that this work group is also thinking is important to include. So mm -hmm. more to come. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah, and I will say that I did pressure um, Kristen and Ashley to come tonight, even though they said they weren't done, they weren't quite to the launch phase. I said, well, if you can just give us a sneak pre <laughs> preview of, of what you've got in the plans, that would be great because I thought it was important for you guys to see it, so. Yeah, and um, I, I wasn't criticizing, I'm just saying that that's an important, I think, um, thing that most people yeah. aren't necessarily aware of uh, with respect to what they put down. I mean, most of us think, oh, we got water soluble paints, we can clean out our paint brushes or whatnot. But where does that water go? It goes into the yeah, it goes into the groundwater uh, right on our property. So. Yes, exactly, exactly. Thank you, Brad. Um, I see Lynn's hand is up. Lynn, what's uh, what's on your mind? Yes, I will. I will keep it um, as short as I can. I wanted to reiterate also how what a good call it was. Abigail to include uh, Ashley and Kristen tonight. I think it's very encouraging to me to see all this progress that's been made. And I was excited to see about educating the young ambassadors. And I also encourage uh, junior high and high school. I think you're getting um, students there who can even bring in uh, more science and understand testing. Uh, I know some things had been done here in Rockford, but that's that's a great audience as well. The last thing uh, Bob pretty much said what I wanted to say, but I want to add this. Um, at the same time that we're reaching out to well owners, how do we, if we're not able to hold industry accountable, what incentives, what can we do right from the get go to include them? Because they have a huge role so often we do all there's so many I mean your program is is very welcoming invitational and you're going to get the kind of people who are going to teach their kids these great uh, practices and awarenesses but there's going to be a lot of people that may not get on board educationally with all this and we got to protect them and find a way to if we can't get the money to get the testing done, what can we do to provide incentive or make sure the, the industry and the townships and the landfill owners are getting, taking it seriously, that's all. So, but thank you so very much. All right, Lynn, you're, you're making me think tonight. I like it, thanks. Um, I see Ken's hand is up next. Ken, what are you thinking? Just a real quick one. Uh, after this presentation, they, we, we need to make sure that this gets on the MPARC website as a bullet to connect to. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. I Continue think our education of folks. So thanks. Very good. I think there's a couple. I think that um, not only the the DHHS website here for this my uh, my drinking water page, but also the Clean uh, Water Ambassadors page has also got a lot. And I think Kristen, they link right is a lot yes. of the stuff on both pages. Yep. Okay. So I think that's um, another point entry point that people could find the information. So. All right. Any other questions, thoughts, or suggestions? Okay. And uh, Lynn and Bob, I'm assuming those are hands up because you can't get them down. But um, if you want to talk again, go ahead and unmute yourself. No. Okay. That's what I thought. All right, we will let uh, Kristen and Ashley go then for the night. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for a great presentation. And we will probably be talking about you and maybe you, um, bring you back into our world here in a few uh, few meetings and talk some more. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Thank you. All right, so let's go on. Um, Ken, I'm going to put you in the hot spot. 
Um, we did not have a web review subcommittee today, so I'm going to put, unless AJ has anything he wants to talk about, I'm going to put Ken in the hot spot to start us off with um, the engaging the public subcommittee. All right. Uh, we had our final meeting on the issue of engaging the public when it comes to notifications for PFOS in the area that is being investigated. We started back in March and uh, we went through at least 21 different meetings that we were allowed to attend. Some were uh, local government leaders meetings and some were just uh, information meetings and town halls. And from those, what we determined was that, I need you to scroll down a little bit there. Kelly, there. Uh, we determined that uh, there were 17 unique uh, uh, sites addressed and in those sites uh, we had several different situations one where the compounds never left the site uh, we had six the surface water and residential well contamination was uh, had PFOS compounds and five locations uh, looked like they were going to have drinking water well and uh, surface water contamination. So we developed these recommendations for the COG to consider and we'll hand this off to them tonight. Uh, and I'll go right through each one of these bullets. Uh, qualifying an investigation. Eagle should notify the public of all PFOS investigations likely to impact any household water supply or body of surface water. This notification must be provided at the beginning of any investigation or any current investigation. Direct notification at a minimum must be given to local units of government and likely impacted households. What constitutes an initial notice? Prior subcommittee discussions reached a conclusion that notification should, as a minimum, require notice to impacted and potentially impacted households, regardless of property ownership status. Local units of government, including but not limited to local government, health departments, and local media outlets. Notice should include a brief summary of Roll up. What basis? What was the basis for the investigation? Historical record, records, sampling, type of facility, or witnesses. What PFOS chemicals are likely or possibly involved, including known associated health risks? The extent of the contamination to the extent known. If not known, explain why and provide timelines. Next steps. If known, include expected sampling schedules, testing planned, and drinking water treatment. Residential well sampling and testing, directing residents to information and expertise on how to sample their own well water if concerned. Contact information, provide the names of the state and local officials familiar with the site, with the investigation and PFOS contamination generalities and specifics. Need for ongoing process notification. Water and other test results and other relevant information should be released for public access with notification as soon as the data are verified to have met quality assurance, quality control criteria. If responsible parties are not investigating as required, let neighbors and the media know. 
Rather than waiting for all testing to be completed, smaller batches of qualified test results should be released to the public as they become available. Provide education resources, including an online, easily accessible, periodically updated PFAS 101 course, and includes content of residential drinking water wells, as well as links to local resources, including names and contacts for local health department and medical expertise. Scroll up. Continue the development of the web-based PFAS contamination location system, currently anticipated for the first quarter of 2022. Such a computerized mapping system would allow private drinking water well owners across the state to independently gauge PFAS hazards in their area based on available information. So we're, we're handing this off to the COG for them to make consideration of these recommendations. I want to thank everybody that gave us all the input they gave us. We had uh, several meetings, including three uh, just work sessions. So now I would be glad to answer any questions. Um, Tony's sorry. hands up. Yep, got a couple hands up. Tony's first. <clears throat> yeah, first of all, Ken, thank you and everybody on the subcommittee for the work that you've done. I know you put in a lot of time and effort and thought into this process. But the the first question that I have, and, and just having just really seen this, I saw parts of it at the subcommittee meeting tonight, but I didn't see it all. Um, in in your point one, which is the beginning notification. There's a reference to the word they should notify the public of all PFAS investigations likely to impact any household water supply or body of surface water. Um, the word likely, um, I just wonder, I'm thinking about the Traverse City incident, and the first thing that came to mind when I saw that was, I suspect that Eagle would say that they shouldn't have notified the, the, the residential well only in February of 2020 because they may try to say that it wasn't likely. I'm concerned about that word, and I am concerned that um, given the bent of Eagle to keep to kind of keep things close to the vest, that this would not result in any change in what happened in Traverse City. And I, I'd like to hear your and, and maybe Abby's thoughts on that. And my thought is that in the case of Traverse City, after we researched it, that was clearly there was likely contamination and everybody should have been notified on those 16 wells because that was something that Eagle knew was there and the potential was there and they informed the airport of that. Uh, maybe the board likely is a little soft and that's why the COG can take and, and develop something more than that. Now let's look at what we saw in Lansing, the capital city airport, it's likely that there are several of those drinking water wells that could be contaminated. Uh, if you take Pelston as an example, the Pelston, I was up there this weekend looking around. Pelston's, uh, you'd think it was fairly distant from the airport, but the runway's not far from where those uh, houses are that are contaminated. So there's, there's a strong, likely potential uh, anywhere that a triple f was used that, that it could be contaminating so that's why we struggled with that word likely or probably or possibly uh, and we we want eagle to know that we're clearly in the corner of letting everybody possibly that could be contaminated know that there's a potential there and uh you know, the, the capital city thing is probably going to be more than just those ones that have been door knocked that are going to be in, uh, impacted. So mm -hmm. that's my my thought on that. Likely. How about you, Abby? Um, you know, I think our goal as MPART is always protection of public health. Um, and we do our best, as you can see from the efforts we took around capital city. Uh, 
Lansing Airport, you know, we really try hard to, to do that um, and take extra measures to try to accomplish that. Um, you know, the word likely is going to be based on the best available information that that project manager has at any moment in time. It's always going to be subjective, but, you know, our, our project managers are going to do the best they can. And, you know, it's always easy to come back and, and maybe second guess efforts. But the intention there is to be as transparent as possible, to uh, protect public health as best as we can, and to work with the information that we have and the resources that we have. So, um, you know, I think that if you want to leave the word likely in, that's fine. If you want to alter it, that's fine too. I know your intentions and that's what we're aiming for. Um, but we are all human and, you know, we try our best and some days we do really well and other days, you know, uh, we, we might miss the goal. So, but I think that the intentions are there. So I don't know if Tony, if that really answers your question, but. Well, yeah, I'm just, I'm just concerned because the explanations that I heard around the, the non-disclosure at the time of the February, 2020 letter was that Eagle didn't know, have enough information to know and didn't even know if it was likely that there was contamination. And so, I see this as something that really might not, in its implementation, might not result in the change that I think the subcommittee intended. Well, I think that's that's every every situation is going to be site by site cases. In the case of where uh, you know the um, Cherry Capital Airport, we did not have any on site information. What we did know about groundwater uh, flow would have made us take any likely plume farther to the south or farther to the east, which would have made it not in that particular neighborhood or maybe not in that particular um, uh, street because it really ended up on one street versus the rest of them. So yeah, I you know that's always a possibility. We have to have data. That's why MPART relies as a science-based data-driven program. That's how we make our best decisions is based on data. And when we are trying to get out notifications before we have data, then it then it is based on our best available information we have at that time. So then there would not have been a different result under this wording. I don't know. You know, I, I think we would have, you know, obviously at that point uh, we were working with the airport um, and I and and I think that's maybe something else for additional thought here is um, while there's a lot of uh, notification in this document for Eagle, um, I understand it from you guys and listening to these conversations that you also think that responsible parties should have notification responsibilities too. And so um, that's another angle that I think should be explored as well. And Tony, when when I got involved and started looking into the Traverse City situation, there was the one letter that said there were 16 drinking water wells that could be impacted when they asked the airport to start doing the testing. So I want to put that up front and not just to the responsible party, because we've seen in many of these investigations, the responsible parties not stepping up to do what they should do. And many times those are government municipal bureaucracies that are that are in the way of getting something accomplished. So the more information that the people get, the, the better it's going to be for them to take their own well into their own hands and, and do something. So I I intend this this to prevent what happened in Traverse City. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I can I, I hear you there. I, I just I'm concerned that the word the wording is the, it should be massaged to fix that because the le I, I'm familiar with the letter that you saw and that's the one I'm talking about. And that's that's the letter that Eagle initially said was, you know, there was not enough there to to notify people. And I think Eagle would potentially continue to say that they didn't know at the time that it was likely and therefore no change. So I'd, I'd like to see that wording changed. Well, that's up to the, the cog to do that and, and 
we wrestled with that word. We had several different words in there, and we just settled on likely. We have a okay. lot of I, other yeah. hands as well. Yeah. Lynn was up, I think. Yeah, Lynn? Yeah, okay, um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I can understand the word likely. I wonder if the word potential with potential impact and um, and there I would say err on the side of caution <laughs> you know don't don't project the likely because it's just err on the side of protecting people just in case that's the way to go and I think it's pretty I think we've all been around the block enough to know that potential par uh, parties are not going to be running at this opportunity to uh, you know, get on this right away. We've got to we've got to understand that it's people we're protecting, and we've got to find ways to work with these potential responsible parties. But at the present, this this is what we're up against. Um, I will point out, without saying names, but I did my own private research, and I I was aware back three meetings ago, someone wanted to trace down or track down what brought this about here in Traverse City. And unfortunately, the same individual that, um, in my opinion, one person, I'm not talking about all of, all of Empart, but uh, really dropped the ball on notification in Rockford. And that same person was also involved in notification here in Traverse City. That person also doesn't work at Eagle any longer. But sometimes there can be an employee for a person that is um, not doing the best job on the part of the public. I believe, Abigail, that, that you are. I, I, I know you and I've seen the change that's come about in Rockford, but I encourage Eagle and I'm sure there's other people, uh, you know, higher ups listening in on this. Um, you need to take action, Eagle does, mm -hmm. when, when employees are repeating actions that involve costs to human health and safety. And that's something I haven't really pursued, but I did my homework and that's another path to follow. Um, but for those who are upset with Eagle and, that, and some of these track records, there are a lot of good people doing their very, very best with minimal time and resources. So it's a it's a real balancing act. It's complex, um, and that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I will say, Lynn, that's you know, this cog is part of the reason that we're trying to do these precautionary sampling events um, in anticipation of contamination. Right. Um, because I think in the cases where we're talking around airports now, we have enough trends to know there's mm -hmm. potential likely impacts in some of these cases. So yeah. just let it be clearly known, I think. I, I don't know. There's a lot of people I've talked to or emailed back and forth on this group. But really, we are the ones who have risen through lots of disappointments and lots of hurdles. And we are telling you, Eagle, on behalf of so many other people who are the not the least bit aware of any of these issues and maybe ought to be that it is time to truly put the public first through action and we need these responsible parties to step up i don't know what's what it's going to take but that's where i think we need to put more pressure thank you thank Len. you for the work you are doing thank you Lynn. appreciate it I see that Randy has a hand up. Yeah. Randy, want to say a few words? Yeah, Abby and, and the group, good evening. I'm sorry, my internet is really spotty tonight. Uh, look at the chat. Ken mentioned Pelston. Um, you know, we have been trying to work with Emmett County and Pelston Regional Airport for you know, the last 14, 15 months that came up just before COVID. So um, we have a lot of information that's being updated on the uh, website. And Ken, you can look at that there. I didn't hear all the comments Ken had. Um, and I really apologize because my internet, I don't know if it's the connection or whatever is really bad. 
not to mention my allergies are still kicking my assets. Okay, so <laughs> Debbie, good to see you. Hang in there. Tony Spaniola, hope everything is good. Uh, miss you, bro. Um, give me a call. Look at the chat. Um, I'll answer any question Pelston has. Yeah, yeah, Randy, I was just comparing Pelston with what I saw tonight in the Lansing uh, airport presentation. And it, it, there's just so many more houses around the Lansing airport. And I was just surprised at how impacted those houses in Pelston uh, had and, got. And Ken, I want to respond that we, we really know based on uh, residential well sampling where that plume is. Right. And we recently sent Emmett County a section 14 letter saying you are responsible. You need to continue the investigation. Abby is a supervisor for the Grand Rapids District formally. Uh, we are moving through the uh, compliance uh, violation notice and enforcement activity. We recently actually this afternoon, we sent Pelston a um, uh, an FAA grant that I hope they will use. So um, we are really, really deeply involved with Pelston. So if Ken, mm -hmm. if you have any questions or any constituents up there, um, give me a holler. Uh, we are really trying to stay on top of this. I'm fortunate enough to have a staff person that can handle that. You know, downstate, it's really difficult because there's so many airfields, so many limited staffing. So yeah. thank you yeah. for that, Ken. Just know that we're here for you. Look at the chat um, and we're here to help. That's what our goal is, all of you. Okay, thank you, Randy. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Randy. Appreciate that. Um, I think we still have a couple hands up. It looks like uh, AJ might be next. AJ, you got your hand up still? I do, thank you, Abby. I just wanted to make three quick points. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is, although this looks kind of long, um, it is essentially what was presented to the larger COG a month ago. So there's not a whole lot of change, but it was modified to incorporate the comments that we had received. Um, one of the the main issues that um, you know is not, not included versus last month is there was a proposal to have a minimum number of homes before this would apply. In other words, before we had to go out to the press or something like that, uh, it was our intention that even if there was a single location, that that well owner would be notified in accordance with these notification requirements. It just, you know, was looking into uh, Eagle Resources and is it practical to do all this even for a, a well location. And the subcommittee discussed that and we decided, yes, it is. And so as it stands, even a single well will trigger, trigger these notification provisions. And then finally, as to Tony's point, which I think is a good, um, maybe rather than using likely, um, I, I kind of like Lynn's idea of potential. It's a, a little less wiggle room, I think. But the whole intention of including likely or potential was to be more expansive, not more restrictive. And, you know, we didn't want to rely on only, you know, only notifying for sites where we know there's PFAS contamination, but also potential or likely. And I think as between potential and likely, potential maybe is a little less ambiguous and may go towards addressing some of, of Tony's concerns, but Tony, we're certainly open to uh, additional suggestions. Please know that that was intended to be expansive rather than um, limiting notifications. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Charlie's got his hand up as well. Charlie, got some thanks. comments? Thanks, Abby. Can you hear me? Yeah. All righty. I want to thank. Uh, AJ and uh, Tony and Lynn for their uh, responses and input. Good points, each and all. I was going to suggest, and I, I don't know the COG process and protocols very well, but I was going to suggest that um, perhaps the COG 
uh, could schedule a meeting to discuss all these points and discuss nothing else these other than this uh, draft recommendation, a draft set of recommendations, this draft document, which had been provided by the subcommittee to the COG, and uh, in doing so, allow the COG, including the subcommittee members who are part of the COG, to take ownership, revise the document as the COG sees fit, and move it along to EGLE. Thank you. Yeah, I see Bob's hands up. Ken, thank you very much for all you've done. This is um, excellent work. You know, I've been a person who has been skeptical. Um, and you and Abby have convinced me that you're going in the direction of transparency, which is all we could ever ask. Um, I, I ran into a situation last week with the Brighton Township dump here with an issue that um, I'm a little confused on. Abby, maybe you can straighten me out. Um, mm -hmm. Ms. Fisher, uh, Lisa Fisher, I believe, um, mm -hmm. it, and her slide indicates that MDHS and local health department lead the public health planning and response. Mm -hmm. um, and that issue to me was whether or not um, in some way, MPART is deferring to the health department and to the local health departments and giving them the opportunity to fail to notify residents because they don't think it's such mm -hmm. a big deal um, for whatever reason. And so that looked like a loophole to me. And I just yep. wanted to make sure that you um, they, that we're clear on whether you're the lead or whether they are. Um, it's a yes. We are actually all the lead. Can I take the screen for a second? That's a great question, Bob. Yeah. And I want to. Um, oh goodness, let's see if I can put this into presentation mode. Oops. There we go. All right. Um, let me see if I can steal the slide for just a second. I'll show you. I think what is a good graphic for um, explaining that. So uh, DHHS and local public health definitely have a role at MPARTS table, right? They're going to help make recommendations for the public health uh, needs. Um, the data comes, all of that sampling data for any residential drinking water well comes to MPART. Uh, it usually comes directly to EGLE, directly to DHHS, and directly to local public health all at the same time. So everybody's getting the same data, but when it comes to recommendations for how to um, respond for public health, that is DHHS's role. They partner with us directly, so EGLE gets the data. EGLE works on investigation and trying to understand the the geology and the conceptual site model for how the contamination is moving, but then DHHS's role is to help and actively respond uh, to protect public health. So they are definitely at this table. They're an integral part of it, along with EGLE, along with all eight of our uh, seven of our partners. And then, you know, straight at that table, then in almost every situation is local public health. Uh, working directly with DHHS and with the project team. So you heard, um, you heard, uh, uh, oh my gosh, Kim, <laughs> I'm losing, I'm losing my mind. Uh, you heard Kim earlier talk about the Lansing Capital Airport had, is on a, on a junction of three counties. So she has three counties, three municipalities, and three health departments that she was working with for that effort um, and so it's really important at right at the get-go that local public health is involved as well as the local officials as well as DHHS so we're we're this is what makes MPART so successful is this collaboration right from the get-go everybody knows their lanes we all have a lane we all stay in our lanes we all have regulatory authority to do what we do 
but we all have to work together as a team in order to really get really good results. And that is why um, MPART is so successful. That's why, you know, we are leaders in the country for PFAS response. That's why we have been able to, you know, do all of the pretty tremendous work that we have uh, done so far. So right. does, does that um, answer your question, Bob? Just, I want to make sure just I to, get to there. Just to follow up, Abby, um, yep. I, I completely understand that it's impossible to coordinate all those uh, widgets, but uh, the in the case where you have an identification and MPART has the information that this new procedure requires public notification. Do you need the permission of the local health department to make that notification um, and or can they override your decision to make that, uh, that notification? If, if the state health department is making the recommendation that they be that a local resident be notified, um, I do not, yeah, I, I don't think there would ever be a case where they wouldn't agree with the state health department with DHHS on a recommendation like that. Um, in all my years, I've never seen that. Now, we've had a few local officials that are wary about giving out information, but that's usually because they just don't understand the situation. Um, I can't ever remember a situation where we've had uh, local public health that didn't work collaboratively with uh, DHHS, but we do have, I think is Marcus still, or Bill, do you guys want to recommend? Um, yep, I'm on Abby. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I can agree. I can agree with you on that, that generally speaking, when we make a recommendation, if we have a health protective recommendation, um, we work with local health. I've never seen them ever say we don't want that recommendation. And I'll be honest, if they're ever for some reason, we can't get a hold of them. We think it's health protective. We think it's urgent. We can make that recommendation ourselves and reach out to the individuals ourselves. We have toxicologists making these recommendations based on what they see as being health protective. Um, and to go along with what Abby said too, we have our own geologists that we use. So not only do we use Eagle to generate that conceptual site model for us to see who might be impacted, we have our geologists looking at it and working as a team with Eagle's geologists, we can build a more robust model a lot of times out of that. So yeah, I, no way would we ever not go public with a recommendation because people are saying not to. If we think it's necessary, it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I, I may, with all due respect, where I live and where I, wh what I deal with, um, I, uh, I see a different world. But uh, thank you for your um, optimism. Appreciate it. Well, and I think, you know, Bob, what's been done in the past, we know is not always working and it's not always a good model. And that's what we're really trying to change. You know, I think this MPART's only been around since uh, the end of 2017. We really got going in 2018. So we're only talking about a few years worth of work here um, and we're already making significant changes across our state. So we're gonna continue to use this model um, because it works so much better than anything else we've ever had. And Thank you. I, I know as a project manager, as a as a supervisor, and now as a, you know, MPARTS executive director, there's not a better model than this one for getting things done. Now we do still have the human effect and the human element to this, but um, we have many, many people at these tables. And so if there's one person who's got reservations, we'll listen, but ultimately we're always going to err on the side of uh, public health and protection. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. All right. Any other comments, questions, thoughts on that? Because I think we're, um, well, we're out of time and we only had a few um, few things left. So, Randy, you turned your camera on. Were you wanting to talk? No, I guess not. All right. We'll leave Randy alone. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, share with everybody that on the COG, I plan on sending the document uh, with one correction, likely to potential, out to every one of the members so they have the uh, current copy of what's there. And uh, then it's up to the COG to determine what the next step is. So I thank everybody for okay. putting up with us for the past few months. 
All right, excellent. Thank you, Ken. All right. Um, and, and I also want to take a minute and thank you guys for, um, you know, really some great months of really good conversation, thoughtful. You guys have put your hearts and souls into this document, and I really do appreciate your thoughtfulness to that. So we're going to take um, some time and be equally as thoughtful about it. I'm going to take it to my leadership. We're going to take that time to be thoughtful and make sure we give it due consideration, make sure we understand um, how this, you know, what the uh, full ramifications are and how this, you know, where it can best fit, how it's going to do it, um, and then we will come back to you. So, Tony, I see you got your hand up. Yeah, I just want to make sure we're clear on next steps. So, Ken is <laughs> going to circulate the revised document to the COG, and then we're going to come back and make the, the, the final COG decision at the next meeting or at a special meeting or what what's the next step? I think I'll leave that up to you guys. Do you think you need another meeting to discuss additional uh, changes or is this a matter of, of one slight change and and you're ready to submit? Well, I, I personally agree with Charlie's suggestion that we at least have time to review it. And I know a draft of it may have been sent out last month, but that we have a chance to review it um, one last time and then, uh, you know, formally approve it or change it or whatever at the, at an, the next meeting. I think the intent was to vote on it today, but given that, you know, there are comments and concerns, um, I, I'd concur, I guess, with, with Tony to say, why don't we, you know, give this a good or block a good at least half hour in the next meeting, um, given that there weren't a whole lot of comments, and just make sure we have all comments on uh, with everyone reviewing the latest draft, and and um, hopefully we can get this moving forward uh, um, at the next meeting. So, um, oops, go ahead, Lynn. Your hand is up. Yeah, um, I was going to suggest what if we just what happens is usually about five days before we all start thinking about the next meeting. What if we did a mid mid month meeting that everybody who's really has concerns takes the time to review this and go through it. And then we they again, that gets sent out to all the people, the CAG citizens on the CAG and that we just move it forward um, so we're ready literally to move it forward at the next meeting and not say well then we need to make, wait for the next meeting to vote this time marches on mm -hmm. I, I would be happy to participate in a uh, meeting within two weeks to help the, the you know and I guess anyone who's really got a vested interest in changing the language show up Give them a chance to make the changes and let's be ready to move forward. That that's my opinion. Okay. Excellent. Uh, Charlie will take your comment and then we'll do our M part updates. And I guess we can um, Ken, you can see what you think about scheduling one more meeting. Thanks, so. Abby. I enthusiastically second what Lynn just proposed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, let me finish the slides real quick and then we will we can go back. I've got a proposal for you guys then if that's what you're thinking. Um, as far as topic updates, I don't have anything major. Uh, we're now up to 170 sites. We've got a couple additional sites that have gone live. Um, you know, the PFOMS firefighter sur surveillance that is going on for health monitoring uh, with DHHS is going fantastic. Um, so they've gotten really good participation with that. Um, I think we uh, had a little note on here about email sharing and responses. Um, feel free as the COG to share pertinent um, information and uh, amongst each other and stuff. Uh, we're not, because our inboxes fill up so quickly, 
Um, if you've got a newspaper article or whatever that you want to share around with everybody, feel free to do that. Um, we just can't guarantee that uh, Kelly or Amy or I are going to be able to turn those back around to the group. So we'd prefer that, you know, just go ahead and circulate those things amongst yourself um, because we uh, are usually 50 to 100 emails behind. So. Um, and then I think this was kind of um, my last point here was just talking about ways that, um, you know, we all uh, as as MPART uh, COG members can really act as that community liaisons and advocates. And I think that with the information we got this week from um, uh, Kristen and Ashley's uh, My Well, and uh, from DHHS, I think that'll be another topic that maybe we'll stick on next month's or the months after that agenda of, of additional ways that we can uh, reach out and share that kind of information. So that's all I'm going to say on that stuff. Next slide is the big one because, uh, Kelly, can you go to the next slide? No, nope, keep going. Unless we had any, I don't think we got any agency up updates. Um, so the big question, since we're talking about an extra meeting, um, I know July is tough for a lot of people with vacations and everything else. Do How do you guys feel as a group about taking either July or August off or, or maybe doubling up and putting the extra meeting that you're talking about in June and then skipping July? Thoughts, comments? Ken, I'm going to throw it back to you since you have the heavy burden of of um, leading the next meeting to get your your recommendation done. My my recommendation would be that we have that meeting that uh, only deals with this issue and have it before the next meeting. And I would suggest that that next meeting be that July 13th meeting. And if we're going to take a holiday break, do it in August because if we don't, then we're going to be talking about this issue in August. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm hearing then is you guys would be on for, let's just be honest, um, two weeks from now, um, a short meeting, just the COG to discuss the recommendations. How do you feel about? Tuesday the 22nd we can set it up I can't guarantee I'll be there but we can set it up you guys can discuss things and um, get the recommendations hammered out the 22nd should work right? and, and, but if for some reason I'm not able to make it uh, Charlie can take my place and, and run the committee meeting so 20 okay. seconds. Any um, major objections to that? Either have your comments done and in writing to Ken or Charlie or be there on the 22nd. I think it's a great idea. And, um, yeah. Okay. And I think Kelly, why don't you just send it to the entire group and then if anybody's either they can send their comments or they can um, or they can attend and then we can put it out there. Like I said, I'm going to let that be an internal group where you guys decide, you guys discuss um, and then, you know, go ahead and email your final recommendation. So yeah, Charlie. Yeah, thanks, Abby. Uh, just as far as what Ken suggested, I'm going to ask if it's okay with him, we run that everybody send whatever they have to him if it's an email. There's a chance I may not be able to make that meeting, so I will, uh, you know, kind of be on standby. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if everybody gets their comments to you before then, and um, and maybe uh, then you don't need a meeting, but I guess that's up to the group. And that's that's my issue too. I I I may not be able to attend on the twenty second. So. Okay. Yeah, 29th would work for me. So, Abby, mm -hmm. 
I'm assuming I'm just sending the this to the cog members, right? Yeah, yes. Okay. And and all of the comments need to go back to Ken and his subcommittee for any changes that need to be made to that recommendation. Yeah, they can hold the master documents yeah. so they can they can track the changes. Yeah. I would think so. I just wanted to make sure that we were clear. I wasn't I'm not going to so I, yeah, back. and I don't care what date it is. So Ken, if the 29th works better for you, since you're going to be, well, you could potentially, or I mean, it doesn't have to be on a Tuesday either. You guys are free to make it whatever night you want. What about Just, Monday the 21st, first day of summer? <laughs> the 21st is available for me. You know, then we all have lemonade and ice cream afterwards. And, and the sun is out the longest. So we can yeah, it's the longest day of the year. We ought to be able to get it done. <laughs> there you go. There you I, go. Th this, is, this is Tony. We, we have a national PFAS meeting that night. But if um, that's what works best for everybody else, that's I won't be able to make it. This is Shelly. I wouldn't be able to make it. I have a city commission meeting that night. And how about the 23rd? The Wednesday? Ice cream at Abby's. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wednesdays are much better for me. Wednesdays I great. think we should emphasize that, you know, we needn't be at this interim meeting. The vote is still going to take place at our next meeting. So right. um, obviously we'd like to consolidate as many comments as possible in the okay. interim meeting. But if you can't make it, you know, there's, it sounds like there's still going to be substantial discussion, at least time for it, uh, provided on the, um, what is it, the 13th. Okay, so I'm hearing then a meeting on June 23rd, short meeting internal with the COG to go through any comments and then join back together on the 13th for a final vote. That's what I'm hearing. That works for me. Yep. Ice cream and lemonade. Ken, when do you want your comments back by? I would like them back by the 21st in case that 22nd is a day I can't do any work. Okay. Sounds great. All right. We're going to be done by 8 o'clock here. So uh, last thoughts, comments, questions? Thank you for all the hard work of this subcommittee. Maybe we should have subs instead. <laughs> I, I think ice cream's better. Okay. <laughs> mm, definitely, definitely. All right. So, uh, Kelly, you're good with uh, setting aside those dates and getting those in a email uh, calendar invite to everybody. Uh, yep, I might not send the calendar invite today, but it will come tomorrow. And an email is coming here in just a minute with the document. Okay, excellent. Okay. Kelly, I'll send you the document, and then you you get it to everybody just to make sure the right people get it. Yep, I'm just using the same one that I brought up that Charlie had submitted or somebody did the final version. And just change that likely to potential. Okay, excellent. Sounds good. All right, it is time for um, to be done. So I'd say at um, we're, only, we're only 25 minutes over call. So thank you all for your attention, for your hard work, for your passion. Um, I can honestly say this is, you know, you guys are very, very passionate about this. I appreciate this. You all come from different perspectives, but the progress we've made has been pretty tremendous. So um, thank you and happy June. We will see you. If I don't make it on the 23rd, I will see you in July, but. Um, Thanks, Abby. Right. Helston, contact me. It's in the chat. <laughs> Be well, everybody. All right. Have a good night. See ya. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.